Hey guys, what's going on? Um, so uh, this is going to be a video uh, response to Bionic Dance. Um, I can't set it as a response because she's blocked me. But she asks uh, a couple of questions and she claims that Matthew 419, you know, didn't answer them or whatever. And I'm not going to get into that. I don't know if he's answered them. I don't know. I, I don't know and I don't care. Um, but I thought I would answer these questions. Now I know, Kate, you know, you and I, we've had our run-ins before and, um, well, I would still like to discuss um, our past a little bit. Um, uh, we can we can just move past that. And uh, if you'd like to ever engage in actual uh, intelligent um, conversation in regards to what Scripture says versus what people claim Scripture says, um, I'd be happy to do so. Because it seems to me that, um, number one, you haven't read the Bible. I'm pretty sure you haven't, and I'm pretty sure most of your biblical knowledge is based on what people have argued um, to you, and which is unfortunate because I, what I've noticed is, is that uh, many people that argue um, the Bible haven't really uh, read it or studied it or understand the context and don't understand the history. There's just a lot of things they don't understand, and so they do a really poor job in my opinion, of explaining certain things. So I thought I would uh, take a shot at answering your questions and clarifying some of the things um, that people have said that are just not true. So let's go. There are certain traits that people claim about your God. They say that he is all-powerful. Okay, first, yes. Um, I want to address, yes, there are a lot of traits that people claim about God. Some of them are true, some of them are biblical, and some of them are not. Some of them are, in my opinion, um, interpretations of Scripture. And we all know, you know, we can all read the same book, and we can all kind of perceive it a little differently. We can all, you know... Um, develop our own little nuances or opinions about characters and books after reading the exact same text you know and we can get into discussions about our opinions about certain characters in any book you know that's why book clubs are so popular is because it's fun to uh, read a book with a group of people and then discuss you know the different views so and to answer your question yes according to the Bible God is all-powerful wrong the Bible does not say that God is all loving what the Bible says is that God is love and the context of that is I think in um, first John I believe and where it says that for those who do not love do not know God because God is love so you can say in, from based on scripture that God is love, but that does not mean that God is all loving. What we can say is that God is righteous, which is different. And I want to clarify that because um, let's continue and I'll, I'll, I'll show you why. Okay, first of all, um, God does not want to punish us. That is not the purpose of hell. Okay, according to scripture, hell was created for Satan and his demons, for the fallen. And the thing about God is that God is holy. So we cannot be in the presence of sin. And... So we cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven unless we are resolved of our sin. As far as I understand, and Catholicism has, has a different take on this, but um, as far as I understand, um, uh, hell is just the other place we can go besides heaven. God takes no delight in our condemnation. He does not punish us. It is kind of like it's a two-way street. You either go one way or you go the other. And you can't go down the street that leads to heaven if your sin is not forgiven, if it's not absolved. Okay, let's continue. Somehow become sin-free. 
Well, we can become, we cannot become sin free. That is another misconception. We can never be sin free. There was only one who was sinless, and that was Christ Himself, God in the flesh. Okay, so but what Christ did, and we'll get to this later, was allow, He was the perfect Lamb, He was the sacrifice in order to absolve our sins so that we could enter into the kingdom of heaven and be in the presence of God. Here's the thing, an all-powerful God should be able to just poof the sin out of existence. I agree. He is an all-powerful God, and he is capable, according to scripture, of all things. Um, now, what you're talking about is whether it's within his will to do so. And let's continue so we can get to that. Okay, well, number one, God is not all loving, but I agree. I think God uh, wants to, but it's not within his will. And we can argue for days on the concept of God's will, and we can get into, you know, uh, his glory, and we can get into our good, because God does things for his glory and our good. These are a according to scripture. So your argument that... God is all powerful, um, but he is all loving, and therefore he should do things the way you think he should do them is wrong. Just because you would do things a certain way with your mind, with your perspective of the universe, does not mean that God does not exist because he doesn't do them the way you think he should do. Or it does not mean that God is... Um, his, is a jerk like you like to say this a lot that God is a jerk because he decides not to do stuff that you in fact say you would but we don't know exactly you know what you would do in God's position um, you, we can never know this but let's continue and yet your God doesn't do it now this isn't about evidence like you claim I don't care about the evidence let's... you don't care about the evidence Huh, I thought you were all about evidence. Maybe I'm missing context here, but that's a great clip. <laughs> For the sake of argument, pretend that your religion is completely true. Let's just take that for granted, uh, at least for the purposes of this discussion, and discuss this discrepancy between how your God is described and what he's doing about sin. Okay. Um, you see, that's the problem, Kate, is that how God is described may not necessarily be accurate. All we can do is look to scripture about, you know, how he is defined. And we can only gain a certain amount of, um, of, of perspective in regards to his, his nature. Most of the, the qualities of God that are listed in the Bible are, are pretty straightforward and pretty clear. But to say that because you hold a, um, an opinion about his qualities and therefore he should act a certain way is a fallacy. Because apparently there's a necessary sacrifice that he had to send this human simulacrum of himself in the form of Jesus Christ down to earth to be tortured to somehow save us from sin. Okay, uh, he didn't have to, number one. Um, he chose to because he wanted us to be covered um, of our sin. He wanted us to be absolved of his sin. Now, here's a discussion that a lot of people get into. They say, you know, well, why did God have to, you know, sacrifice himself and endure all this torture? And it's really horrible. And it's really, you know, kind of heart wrenching. And I agree with all these things. But here's the thing you have to consider. We don't have the mind of God, you know, and we don't know why he does things. I don't think we can ever really know why he's done things or he does things. But I can tell you this. You know, that event was so dramatic and purposely so that we're talking about it 2,000 years later, which was the whole purpose, I believe, of that event. It was supposed to be this huge event 
that gets people talking and continues the conversation for thousands of years. So I think, I mean, whether you agree or disagree with the way he did it, it worked. And we're still talking about it today. Now, why would an all-powerful God need to save us from sin that way? And That's a good question. Um, number one, he didn't need to save us from sin. He chose to save us from sin. And why he did it that way, we won't know until we're standing before him. And maybe we'll think about asking him. But until then, to propose that God isn't real because you disagree with the way he's done things is, again, it's a fallacy. Why would an all-loving God do it that way? Number one, he's not all-loving. He's righteous. That's what scripture says. You need to stop using the term God is all-loving. God is love, God is righteous, he is omnipresent, and he is all-powerful. These are things that are supported in scripture. It does not say that he is all-loving. Hey, that was the question I was asking you. It was about, about God's methods. That's what okay, well, questioning God's methods... Um, is um, kind of pointless because all you can really do is use your perspective and your perspective is limited compared to God's perspective. I mean, can we agree on that? Can we agree that God's perspective is farly or, or far more vast than your perspective as a human being ever could. And so to question his methods or to question his actions would be short-sighted and a bit arrogant, right? I'm talking about, and his motivations. But for some reason, you don't seem to get this very important point. I don't know why it's so difficult for you. But seriously, that's my question. Why would God get rid of sin that way instead of an easier, kinder way? Um, again, Kate, you're asking another human being for his perspective, and I'm sure he had a hard time answering this because there really, there is no answer. You're expecting another human being to answer for God. You know, I, I would, if I were you, I would take 10 minutes out of your day and maybe ask God yourself, you know, no one has to know about it. You can just kind of go into your bedroom and you can you can say, God, if you're real, I'd really like to know the answer to this question. You know, and then meditate for a while. And who knows? Maybe he'll send you some kind of divine revelation and poof, you'll become a Christian and you'll be born again. Who knows? I guess anything's possible, right? That's the question I'm asking. <sighs> anyway, until next time, fellow space travelers, this is Bionic Dan saying Matthew 419 seems to be a chowder head. Now... This is what I have a problem with you, Kate. This is one of the reasons why um, I got into it with you so bad is because you're calling this man a chowderhead because he couldn't answer the question or didn't answer the question. You say, it doesn't make him a chowderhead. Maybe he didn't know the answer. Maybe he just didn't know how to answer the question. Maybe he was waiting to do a little bit more research so he could answer the question from a biblical point of view and not misrepresent the Bible. You know, as Christians, we're really careful when we answer questions like this because we don't want to answer incorrectly and give the wrong impression to people. So a lot of times, we'll take our time with a question like that and we'll do the best we can to answer biblically. You know, and to call him a chowderhead for it is just you demeaning another human being because they couldn't speak for God when you snapped your fingers. And that's arrogant, Kate. And I really wish that you would do what you say, you know, your mantra and and think instead of running on your automatic anti-theistic engine. I wish you would think and see people as individuals and stop calling them names. You know, maybe you might learn something. 
Thanks for watching guys. I hope this video was enjoyable and educational. Um, if you have any more questions about the nature of God, which <laughs> I can't really answer all that well, I suggest read the Bible and then we can talk about scripture. Thanks for watching.